For sure. I always say that organized religion and organized crime are very similar, right? Because when you're there <laughs> in the family, you're a fiercely loved. And when you begin to deviate and you find yourself pushed to the periphery, well, it's like horse heads in the bed and concrete shoes. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Today's pod is a candid conversation with John Pavlovitz. John is a writer, pastor, storyteller, and activist from Wake Forest, North Carolina. I'm having him on the show because not only is he a thought leader publishing best-selling books, but over the past six years, his blog, Stuff That Needs To Be Said, has found its way into the national zeitgeist and into a diverse and worldwide audience, recently passing 100 million views. A 25-year veteran of church ministries, John is kind of an anomaly in today's Christian community with his deep commitment to equality, diversity, and justice, both inside and outside of his faith. His best-selling books include A Bigger Table, Hope and Other Superpowers, and the most recent If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk, which was just published this past September. I found John around the same time a lot of people did, immediately after Trump was elected when he published a piece called This is Why We Grieve Today which explained the profound sadness so many people were feeling after that result. He spoke to me in a way that resonated, from a place of spirituality that I had given up on. Here was this man, still part of the church that I had no part in, who really seemed to get it, who connected right with the heart of an issue and spoke with the kind of authority only someone who is in it for others and not themselves can really do. I have followed him ever since, and his writing is not only something that gives me what faith is supposed to offer, like hope and understanding and peace, but he's also given me insight into my friends and family who are still deeply committed to religion in a way that makes me feel disconnected from them. I'm having John on today to talk about Christianity and my thoughts on how it's co-opting America and what his thoughts are on how to reconnect with these people who seem to be lost down a rabbit hole, where their faith and political beliefs, which should be antithetical, have somehow become aligned, and how we move forward, especially with this increasing dissolution between the separation of church and state. So without further ado, please welcome my guest today, author, pastor, activist, and gifted wordsmith, John Pavlovitz. Welcome, John. Lee, it is so good to be with you today. Thanks so much for the invitation. Oh my goodness. I Thank you for joining me today. I'm so happy to meet you face to face, even if it's just like this. Um, I just love your work and I'm constantly inspired by what you're putting out into the world. Um, I bought your newest book the day it came out. So I'm a huge fan of yeah. your ability to capture the sentiment of the moment and just distill it down into something we can all connect with. Well, I'm, I'm grateful. And the feeling's mutual. I can remember many times sitting with my wife and saying, you have got to see this woman. She is speaking my heart. And uh, so it's so great to finally uh, connect and to know that we're doing very similar work in just a different capacity. I would totally agree with that. I think that um, you're doing it from a place of faith. And I am definitely doing it from a secular position. And I I would start with that. You know, clearly your comfort with questioning established religious dogma makes you kind of a unicorn in mainstream Christian circles, right? That's not happening. But it's your honesty and your ability to question your own faith and people of your faith that drew me to you in the first place. You know, I grew up in the church. Um, Like I was in the church every Sunday during the school year. Um, I was baptized. I was confirmed. I did the choir. I did the youth groups. I was in the play. I mean, the Mm. whole gambit. Um, I took a bunch of years off. And then when my husband and I got together, we actually joined a church here in Los Angeles and we did our premarital counseling there and we did courses. And and then over time, we've really drifted further and further away from that world. You know, the church feels like it doesn't fit us anymore. It feels yeah. wrong for our morality. We, we do the Christian traditions, you know, we do Christmas, but probably from a more secular place than we ever did before. And we definitely don't mm-hmm. go to church. We are not raising our child in the church. And so when I think about it these days... It, I feel like I'm more agnostic than anything else. You know, I believe in something bigger than myself. Um, Is it nature? Is it the universe? Is it God? I don't know. But I know for sure I do not connect with the God that these American evangelicals are preaching and praying to, the one that apparently wants to control every aspect of our existence and give people cover for their bigotry and hate. So what are your feelings on 
what happened to a vast amount of American Christianity and how do we, com- mm. I don't know, connect with people who are using their love to hate and control? Yeah, you know, my story has been similar in that I grew up in a fairly traditional Italian Roman Catholic setting and then drifted away from my faith in college and then only got pulled back into organized religion when my then fiance and I were thinking about getting married and ended up uh, volunteering for a small little church that was really living out the, the stuff that I wasn't see I wasn't seeing lived out in the other communities that I had been a part of. And we just fell in love with this community. And I started working with with teenagers there and got pulled into the world of ministry because that was never the aspiration. I, I always say that as I began to teach students a faith that I didn't really have at the time, my faith began to grow. But the more I walked down that road and the more the churches got larger and I was uh, immersed in this world, I began to see the toxicity of the church in ways that I hadn't before. And I had these tensions in me between the person I thought I was supposed to be as I followed Jesus and the pastor that I was expected to be. And so there, as I began to speak, it was a matter of figuring out how can I how much can I say? And and then I realized at some point down the road, I was going to probably be an authentic pastor or an employed pastor. And I think, you know, what, what, what you see is, is from the outside, what I saw from the inside, that the, the, the fear that organized religion leverages at its worst, that's what we're seeing. We are seeing the manifestation of something that has for decades leveraged people's fears and phobias and prejudices and has them terrified. And no one is at their best when they're terrified. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you also wrote that fitting in can be stifling, right? Like you have this need when you're in the church uh, to conform to what you're told. And even if you're a minister, you still have that need, which I think then leaves people that they're afraid that they'll be kicked out if they won't be part of the group anymore, if they ask questions or, or question the dogma. Does that make sense? Oh, for sure. I I always say that organized religion and organized crime are very similar, right? Because when you're there (laughs) in the family, you're a fiercely loved. And when you begin to deviate and you find yourself pushed to the periphery, well, it's like horse heads in the bed and concrete shoes. You know, I think for, for me, it was realizing that the pull of community is so strong and spiritual or otherwise, people will do a lot to stay in that community. And and that's a true fear. I mean, there are people living, especially in really red areas, and they say, you know, if I express these doubts or or these deviations from orthodoxy, well, I'm gonna lose friends and family members and business opportunities. So that that fear, the best things about spiritual community is the, there that's also the the greatest danger of it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. People don't want to lose their friends. They don't want to lose their place that they go. They don't want to lose their groups. And if you have to fit in, you know, if your church is preaching gay people are bad, and even if in your heart you feel they aren't, to speak it out loud means you alienate yourself from your community. Right. And even as a minister, I didn't realize when I began the political nature of being a pastor because or clergy of any kind, because you're you're um, you love a community of people and you want to serve those people and live alongside them. But you eventually become beholden to them and you begin to soften your language or second guess what you're what you're actually saying as opposed to what you believe. And so that's a true place where I think. People in the church, you know, I wrote a blog blog post called If I Have Gay Children, which really started me on the path to um, this, this where I am now. And what I realized was after that went public, there were hundreds of people in the megachurch that I was ministering in who agreed with me, but they were waiting for permission uh, from someone like me to say that. And so I think more ministers could do well to do that. Absolutely. One of the reasons my husband and I chose the church that we once went to was because they were performing gay marriages at the time. And we really felt like, okay, well, this is a a more traditional environment, but they are representing our way of looking at the world. Because I often feel like 
would Jesus even really like these people that are speaking in his name? You know, there's a an old political cartoon where God is on a cloud and he's looking down at earth and he says, I'm starting to like the people who don't believe in me better. <laughs> right. Well, I that's and that's that's the thing is the thing that grieves me, Lee, is that as someone who was raised in the teachings of Jesus, it's realizing that the people who are most weaponizing their religion have are the ones who have drifted from those teachings and that and yet those teachings would help them uh, just as much as other people. So I'm always trying to get uh, conservative Christians to understand that empathy is the better path, that that collaboration is better than competition and that that we we all benefit when we all do well. And I think that's the saddest part about this is that um, the people who so often use Christianity uh, um, as a weapon or get their identity from it would really not recognize or not love the Jesus of the Bible. Oh, absolutely. They would throw him out as some weird immigrant that had That's socialist right. ideas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. you said, I think you said it well when you said that the American right isn't just failing to draw others to Christ. They're actively repelling people from it, which I thought was really interesting, like this irony that evangelicals who have spent the past 50 years demonizing anyone who rejects Jesus um, are mm. now one of the most compelling reasons to not go to the church, right? Like they are this group of people who make you not want to go to church, which I find fascinating because they want the opposite. Yeah, I could start. I realized as I was moving up through ministry and, and spending more time in the church that I was beginning to wince when I would tell people that I was a Christian because I understood what that aligned me with in their minds, all the conclusions that they jumped to and all the stereotypes that were attached to that because the Christianity uh, that is antithetical to Jesus has the microphone right now. It has the platform and the power and the visibility. And so the challenge is always to let people know that there is an alternative expression of spirituality that is not that predatory, exclusionary thing. Right. You know, you were saying that um, you wish Christians, but specifically Christian Republicans, understood that no one is trying to harm you, you know, take away your ability to worship or um, marry who you love or have autonomy over your own body. Um, mm. But you just want to allow other people to have those same rights. No one's taking them from you. We we don't understand this preoccupation with policing other people's lives. Where does that come from? It, well, it comes from a, a theology that is rooted in fear of the other, that, that it's, it runs on um, needing, it's an ad, adversarial faith. It needs an encroaching enemy to always be fighting. It keeps these people in a, a battle posture. They're perpetually at war. And if they don't have something to fight against, it's they, they've almost lost their identity. And so that's where that comes from. It's a manipulation of people over time to the point where they don't even recognize that this love your neighbor Jesus is the one that they're supposed to be taking their cues from, and yet they least resemble him. And, uh, you know, the people that I run into, my readers are largely, you know, well, they're all over the board, but there's a lot of former Christians or hopeful agnostics, or I call them the community of the convinced, whether they're religious or not, they understand what's happening with the evangelical church and they, they want no part of it. Right. No, I mean, the world feels deeply broken right now, right? It's scary. It's between mm. what's happening in America, what's happening in Ukraine, the rise in communist China, the rise of autocracy in general, uh, what's happening with the climate catastrophe. It's so much for people to try and absorb and take in. And this is usually the part of life where people turn to faith, right? To God for right. comfort or direction. But in many ways, it feels like religion is a root cause of a lot of these problems, religion, maybe, and greed. Um, so what do we do with our fears when we can't turn to faith because faith is the problem? I, I think community is always going to be the answer because what you see in the evangelical church is that um, the isolation 
is something that we're all terrified of. And so people who are are grieving the things you're you're talking about and who are asking the same questions and feeling the same prompts, but and they have some spirituality or at least an understanding or a feeling about the bigger things. I think it's about connecting with people who who can encourage them in community that is an alternative expression um, to those things. So uh, when people gather, when I get to travel and or online, people are gathering and they don't agree with, on everything theologically or politically. There are just some givens in place about uh, their acceptance and about our shared humanity. And I think that's what people need to be doing right now is is asking, uh, who, what do I have? What are the the elemental things that we can stand together on? And we'll deal with some of those those other things later. Um, but people are starving for connection, for authentic relationship, and they really just need a rest. And I think that's um, the part about this religious movement that we're talking about. It is so exhausting, not just for people on the other side of it, for, but for those who profess it. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm exhausted. I'll tell you that. And the thing is, is that we obviously can't just write everyone off, right? Like, you can't, we need our family, we need our friends, we need our coworkers and our police officers and our teachers, we need them in our lives, right? At the very least, we need their votes if we're going to save this country. But I also believe that despite all of the hate that's out there right now, there is just more people out there who are innately good, but they have been mm. co-opted or brainwashed or used for other people's power. And how do we reach out to those people? How do we connect with them when we want to be like, you know, strangle them? You know, how do we love someone that we don't like anymore? How do we connect with people that we just think are dead wrong? Well, I think there's a there's a vast number of people in what I call the humane middle and they they may be Republican voters or they may be part of evangelical churches. You may see them in those buildings on Sunday, and yet they're still willing to listen and they still have the ability to think critically and they still have an instinct that is loving. See, most people tell themselves the story that they're a decent person and no one intentionally goes out into the world and says, I'm going to be cruel to people. And it's yet, yet they're a victim often of the story that they're in. And I think what we need to do is keep speaking to the people who are still willing to listen, who are still willing to be wrong. And there are many of them. Um, I think the, the, the volume of the, the extremists, especially on the right, they've commandeered this discussion on religion. And uh, we have to we have to retrieve it. We have to be able to talk about these beliefs and know that there's there's a safety in that, that not everyone is predatory and not everyone is out to exclude. How do we differentiate those people? I think it's in relationship. This, this is only, you know, we often Lee, get so caught up in the big and the distant, and I think that's always going to overwhelm us. But if we stay in the small and the close, I think there's a lot of agency that we have. And that is always going to be relationally. It's always going to be in our local communities, in the places where we study and shop and worship. And that's where we find out if people are willing to meet us and to, to have substantive debates. And you find out really quickly, you know, who are, who are the people who have really um they're 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 cultist now and they're not reachable right now and who are the people who we disagree with fundamentally but who still see treat us with humanity and that's the bottom line for me i have to be you know we want people to who deal with objective reality that would be really nice but if we can't have that we have to have people <laughs> who are willing to engage us yeah. No. And I think that's the difference. I think we need to assess who is, like you said, culty right now. Once you're in a cult, it's very hard to uh, extricate someone from that. And we only have a certain amount of energy. You know, there's only so much we can do. And so yeah. we need to reach out to the people that are still, like you said, reachable. Um, and what what about people? What about people that say, well, my uncle is horrifying or my mother is quoting Fox News to me every single day and they're toxic. They're toxic in my life. You know, mm. you you talked um, in one of your pieces about loving ourselves means moving away from toxic people and loving them from a distance. 
Do you remember that? Exactly. You know, there's a lie that we believe that we owe people proximity and permanence, and we don't. We owe them authenticity and to try and reach them and to appeal to their humanity. But, you know, we're, we're people who want to learn other people's stories, and yet we could learn those stories and then decide after we learn those stories or hear those perspectives that this person and I, we're morally incompatible. And it, it's okay to say it's precisely because I'm a loving person that I'm going to distance myself from something that is that is toxic to both of us so that I can be a more whole and available person to the rest of the world. And in people who are watching and listening to this, there are thousands of us, you know, millions of us, the relational fractures of these days are the story that we're often not talking about that there's the politics and the theology, but, but it's the, it's the fractures between people that are, are the most, um, grief worthy, I think. And um, so some people we're going to lose forever, but some we are going to draw closer to because of this. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Like democracy is in deep peril and we need to acknowledge that, but also our relationships are in tatters from what's happened and trying to save yeah. both things at once is exhausting. Yeah, this is, you know, it's a constitutional crisis and a family emergency, I tell people. And and that's difficult because many of the people who who, re who read the things that I write or, or watch you or listen to you, they, they are both activists and they're really empathetic human beings who care about other people. And that's a really hazardous place to be right now. And to try to figure out how do I divide my time and my energy between fighting with a group of people or pushing back against injustice and then taking maybe that some of that energy and putting it into just being with people and caring for them and expressing the very same values, but with a different kind of energy. Right. And you don't need to be a religious person to do that. I mean, I often feel like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, my family goes out in the world and we're good people, not because we think we're going to hell if we're not, but because we want to be good people. Um, I often wonder about religious uh, folks who feel like they have to do this because otherwise this terrible thing will happen. And to me, I think, well, then you're not particularly a good person by nature. You're doing it because you're afraid of the result. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. When you think that God is out to squash you, that's a really lousy reason to be a religious person. Or, right? or you think God is out you think God is out to squash somebody else. And I think it's it's about getting up every day and say, what propels you into the day? And for me, it's it's an empathy, it's a ferocity for humanity. And I think you have people have that whether they're religious or not, which is why I love doing the work that I do because it's this very odd congregation of people who just say, you know what, I, I'm either religious or not, but but these things resonate. Our, the idea of our shared humanity, that appeals to me. And there's a lot you can do within that context. Yeah. And like you said, at the end of the day, it's about community, whether you're a faith-based person or not. It's about people needing each other because humans are by nature a group species. We're not an individual species. We're not a lone wolf species. We work in community. John, I'm loving this. Now let's take a quick break to have some words from our sponsors and we'll be right back after this. Remember how I told you that if I got my dad hooked on Athletic Greens while he was staying with us, he would want it when he got back home? Well, I was right. He just ordered his own Athletic Greens in Canada. He was taking a different daily supplement and he said he felt better drinking the green drink. And that's the thing, with one scoop of Athletic Greens in water on an empty stomach, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day off right. You can't help but feel better on this stuff. That's why Athletic Greens is recommended by professional athletes, is trusted by leading health experts, and has over 7,000 five-star reviews, including one from my dad. Now is the time to reclaim your own health and immune system without a million different pills and supplements. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is gonna give you one free year of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate in daily nutrition. We talked about Smith AI last week, but I'm back to tell you they really are an amazing company. 
If you don't know, Smith AI provides businesses with award-winning virtual receptionists to handle all your calls, chats, and texts so you can unlock new business at a fraction of the cost of hiring in-house staff and stop you from losing leads from visitors to your website or missing calls to grow your business. Smith AI is not your average receptionist service. Since 2015, they've combined the best receptionists across North America, speaking both Spanish and English, with AI technology for superior business communications and client engagement. They integrate with your preferred software and do it seven days a week by phone and 24-7 on your websites using their live chat service. They even answer texts and Facebook messages. Smith AI helps thousands of small businesses across a wide range of industries, including law firms, home service professionals, marketing agencies, and other service-based businesses. Work uninterrupted with more business and less stress and get more leads from your marketing efforts. Try Smith AI today to see why business owners are calling it the secret to client growth and happiness. And Politics Girl listeners will save $100 when you sign up using our code POLITICSGIRL. Visit Smith dot AI to read all the five-star reviews and be sure to use our code politics girl to save a hundred dollars at sign up. Don't let another day go by. Try Smith AI. <laughs> Man, these rhymes are corny, but they're good. It's me and I'm back talking about my pals at Blinkist. If you haven't heard me talk about Blinkist before, Blinkist is a non-fiction book summarizing service that gives you a quick and effective understanding of an entire book in about 15 minutes. You get insights from books called Blinks and from podcasts called Shortcasts. They have more than 5,000 nonfiction titles to choose from, including recent bestsellers. Blinkist allows you to grow both personally and professionally without taking too much time out of your life to do it. It's easy to use and easy to access. Last week, I talked about how I'm learning all about cryptocurrency so I don't check out every time people start talking about it. The next book I'm doing is Super Founders by Ali Temesup who's written a book about what data reveals about billion dollar startups. And since my husband is creating a startup, I wanted to find out how to make it a billion dollar one. So fingers crossed, let's hope it helps. So if you wanna learn new things quickly and enjoyably right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash politics girl to start your seven day free trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist spelled B-L-I-N-K I-S-T dot com slash politics girl to get 25% off and a seven day free trial. Blinkist dot com slash politics girl. Your pin tweet on Twitter is how a former friend who went full MAGA um, told you that your friendship should be worth more than politics. And I think a lot of people have lost friends saying the same thing, like, you should just be fine with the fact that I'm anti-vax, or you should just be fine that I'm using a fake vaccine card, or you should be fine that I think that all immigrants should be put in cages, you know, and you disagreed with this person because you said, it's not just about vaccines or voting rights or immigrants or LGBTQ rights. You said it's these people that they're hurting with these feelings are worth more than our friendship. It's no longer about politics. It's about... Mm something bigger than that well i I think the the whole idea behind the things we're talking about is realizing that life is bigger than than just us and so you know when when i've lost relationships sometimes i've realized that those relationships are the collateral damage of me speaking fully authentically and having these stances and and the other thing i think about is that i i use the illustration of four marias and if I said to someone, I, I know four women named Maria, are they all worth equal value? And most people would say, of course they are. But if I say one of those Marias is your conservative aunt, and one of those Marias is um, a migrant on the borders, and one of, one of those Marias is a transgender teenager in Missouri, and one of those Marias is a mother in Ukraine, what happens when we have when we're silent, it's usually because we want to preserve the relationship with our Aunt Maria, and we're trying not to lose that. But what we're doing is we're we're relegating the other Marias to the sidelines. And, and they often, these other marginalized, oppressed, vulnerable people, need to be represented in our conversations with people that we know. And we're usually erring on the side of keeping the relationship with the people we know and 
and we're disregarding so many others. And so I'm always asking people to pull in the people whose names and faces and stories you don't know. That's good advice. You make me think of that quote that says, I would rather be excluded for the people I include than included for the people I exclude. And I always yeah. think that that's good. You know, if, if I'm included in this group because I'm saying all these other people aren't invited, I don't want that. I would rather be excluded from your group because I didn't shut other people out. And I think that's the thing about drawing people in that you're not familiar with. And I think it's a product of when you get better stories about the world and you understand your privilege and you understand your advantages and you realize that um, the, the people who have not had a place at the table, um, you get a chance to to let their voices be heard in the conversations with people you've been raised in or churches that you've been a part of and at least begin to give the people around you uh, a very a, a better story and more information. And if they're only watching Fox News or, or they're only listening to Franklin Graham, you get to offer a perspective that they desperately need to hear and may not hear any other way than through your voice. Yeah. I always say we're responsible for our people. You know, we have to take control mm -hmm. of our people and even have those awkward conversations and have those moments where, you know, you're at a dinner table and you push back on someone and it's awkward for everyone at the table. But, That's and you right. might not change the mind that day, right? You might not change the mind that day, but over time, mm -hmm your voice will be in that person's head because those are your people. And whether that's your family, your friends, your hairdresser, whoever, you keep mm -hmm. talking because then they hear something on the radio or they hear somebody say something and they think, no, I'm pretty sure that's not right, you know? And it gives them a moment to start changing their narrative. And that doesn't happen unless those of us who care, those of us who want things to be more open and want things to be more um, accepting and see the world as a place where we could actually have equality and equity, push against the people who aren't quite ready. And we keep pushing until we can move them along. Yeah, I mean, that's that's everything, Lee, about what we're talking about because we're, we're, you know, the idea of being a progressive means that there has been a journey, an evolution of thought, a learning, a, a disagreeing with our former selves. And that doesn't happen overnight. And I didn't become a, a progressive pastor and abandon some of those doctrines or that orthodoxy in a moment. It was a, a series of small decisions and conversations. And, and you're right. We get to be a part of a, a moment in someone else's journey. We may not see the results of it, but the hope is that if they hear enough of those things and get exposed to enough alternative uh, sets of information, then their hearts begin to change. And that's really the only thing that's going to do this, right? We can't preach someone or lecture someone or yell them into compassion. They have to, uh, they have to feel it on their own. And so that's a, that's a huge, it's hard to wait for that. Yeah, no, it is hard to wait for that. And it does come back to what you just said about exposure, because I always think it's funny that people call uh, people in cities, elitists, because cities have to interact mm. with so many different types of people. So many, you know, this yeah. idea that you get liberally indoctrinated when you go to college. And I think, no, you just get exposed to a whole bunch of people you had no exposure to before. And all of a sudden you're like, wait, I was supposed to hate these people and they're awesome, right? That is yes. the thing about exposure. Once you're, once you're out there in the world, you can't keep your small mindedness. You can't keep your blinders on. You have to take them off. I think you've even experienced that yourself, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, I went to I went to college in Philadelphia, and it like blew my mind. And and then I, I didn't even have any thought to be a minister. But ten years later, when I started working in the church, I thought I could be that person that I was in Philadelphia, surrounded by diversity and understanding the the beauty of that. And then started to realize that the church, you know, really began to shrink my table. And and I I say that you know that that time in Philadelphia, it really um it. it life begins to argue with your theology or life begins to argue with your politics because you have someone in front of you who is um, arguing with the things you thought you believed. And then you have a choice. Am I going to lean into this story or am I going to just rely on the myth that I feel that is dissolving? And uh, so that's, I think what courageous people do is say, I'm going to lean into this new information. And I think it does take courage because it is terrifying to walk on shaky ground where you are unfamiliar with 
what's coming next and you don't have the answers. And if you don't have the answers, that's a terrifying place to be, especially if you've based your whole life on one identity or one way of doing things. Right. And when you, you know, no one has time for an existential crisis, but I think it's, it's good that we have one, but you're right. <laughs> I think most of the people that we've been talking about that, that manifestation of faith, it, it, it thrives on being certain and it sees, you know, doubts as some sort of moral failing. And yet it's in the questions and the doubts and the uncertainties that I think we, we begin to grow into something that's actually more loving. And I wish more people would be willing to go through that. Well, I also think that in some ways, the Republican Party, which I don't think is the old Republican Party, which is sort of like the MAGA party now, is when you, we said the word cult before, but in itself, it is like a religion. There is only their truth. You must follow their dogma. You know, you have a place of belonging here with us, but you also must say the election was stolen. You must say that abortion is, a, you know, shouldn't be allowed. You must say this. You must say that. You must walk this line. And there are people who are rising to the top of the now Republican Party who are absolutely out of left field, cuckoo bananas. And yet they mm -hmm. are preaching the faith so clearly without question, without existential crisis without thought for truth or validity. They can be caught in a lie. We can say, hey, here's a video of you saying the opposite thing. It doesn't matter because you're believing the faith. And to me, it reminds me a lot of people that preach the Bible. And you can say, hey, um, it says the opposite in this chapter and verse. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. And I find that fascinating because they're so similar. It's a similar way of top-down dogma. Here are the rules. You follow the rules. You belong. Yeah, I think it's a group of people who are so invested in their story being true. They will do anything to make that story true. So if they've decided that God really wants me to discriminate against LGBTQ people or God really wants me to police other people's bodies or, or God really ordained Donald Trump, they will do anything to make that story true because the alternative is I'm no longer a good Christian. And, and what, what I think we, we often fail to realize is, you know, the church is shrinking and yet spiritually minded people have just uh, left that whole thing. And they're saying, okay, I'm going to pursue this on my own. And so that's what I'm, I'm encouraged by. It's realizing that people of faith and people who have no faith are out there and we are the vast majority. And so there is just so much that we can do if we can um, unite and get our kind of energy directed in the same uh, direction. Yeah, we need to unite, that's for sure, because I don't see how the separation of church and state even fits into this new version of America that Republicans are pitching, because it's all very seriously, I mean, you coming from a Catholic background, but Catholic based and almost a more extreme version of Catholicism. Um, I keep thinking of that quote that's often attributed to Sinclair Lewis. Um, when fascism comes to America, it will be wrapped in the flag and carrying a cross. And I feel like that's exactly what's happening. And and the saddest part, at least, and you know this, that really the people who are holding both of those things, God and country, they don't really have a love for the teachings of Jesus or for the foundation of, of America. And so they really have crafted this, this theocracy that is really, it's like this Frankenstein's bastardized version of both God and country. And uh, I think the rest of us have to keep saying, okay, there are beautiful things in both of those traditions that we have to fight for. And that's what's at stake now. Yeah. How do we reconcile the freedom to worship even in this new world? You know, each to his own creed with Christianity attempting to be the one and only religion in this country. You know, other religions should be justifiably angry by this Christian takeover. I know atheists and agnostics are justifiably angry. I mean, who are these people to force their beliefs on us, right? There's a rant yeah. by one of the hosts of the Young Turks, um, which is usually too far to the left for me. But I connect with the rant because she says, I don't care what it says in your Bible. I don't care. I don't care about your religion because I don't believe in it. 
If you want to make decisions based on your religion, you know, have at it. I will support and defend your right to do that. But don't come at me with you have to do this because the Bible says so, because I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe that. Those are not my rules. So why should I have to live by them? I mean, that's that's something that I hear over and over and over from people. And, and that's in the work that I do. It's trying to figure out maybe if someone believes in God or whether they do or don't, what are the things that we, what are our shared beliefs? What can we mutually agree on? And then we begin there. But I think this, this, this extremist version of religion, it doesn't even allow for that conversation to happen. It's, it's all about force and might and asserting its will, which is, I mean, it just doesn't resemble Jesus at all. And so uh, that's, and when you're, when you don't see that anymore, that's the, the scariest part. When you feel that that's natural, um, that's what we're dealing with. Yeah. I mean, I've spent the past week so angry about this row thing, like seethingly yeah. angry. The idea that these religious zealots can use their faith to take my rights and the rights of more than 50% of this country because that's what they want and that's how they see the world. I mean, how are people supposed to work with that? You know, how do we respect it? Because honestly, how dare they? I, I tried to channel last week's pod into how I felt about this and where we can go and what we can do. But from a, a faith-based leader's perspective, what do we do with what's happening right now? Where really this isn't a decision based on liberty or privacy. This is a, a decision that's going to be based on religion. So as someone who works in that world, what can you tell us out here who are just so infuriated? Uh, that that I'm with you, and that there there are tens of millions of people of faith who are exactly there. I mean, we are, are you know that's the part of the work that I do is trying to help people understand that um, I'm as pissed off as they are, and that we are grieving this in the same way that they are. And you know, I think progressive people and progressive people of faith, we are by nature. We're, we're gentler with people because of what we've been talking about. We want to listen to people and get different perspectives. And I think there's often a niceness that we have, a softness that has been a disservice. And so I think right now it's about people getting that, that ferocity for humanity, which people say is anger or hatred in me. I just say, no, I'm, I'm fierce about humanity and I want all people to, to have freedom and to, I want there to be equity and that's not going to just happen anymore. We have to realize that we have to be as vocal as we can be. And I would love for people of faith, especially to say, you know what? I don't, I'm not a Republican. I'm not an evangelical. I have a deeply rooted sense of moral values. And that's precisely why I push against this ugliness. We have to be a warrior for humanity. I think that's exactly right. We we can still be soft, kind people, but we have to fight with ferocity for other people and for liberty and for equality and for equity. I was just, you know, thinking that we, we often think that um, we don't want to be offensive to people. And I, I remember a group of Christians saying to me, John, you know, we, we believe in all these things, but we're nice people. We want to be known as the nice church. And, and I said, you know, nice is nice, but you could also be Christ-like. You could also be loving. You know, Jesus was, you know, the, the Jesus that I grew up with, he's kind and he's generous and compassionate, but he's not always nice. And we have to be willing to make people uncomfortable. And you can be loud and loving at the same time. <gasps> John, you're speaking my language. I am both loud yeah. and loving. <laughs> For, <laughs> now listen. Excellent. I, I, <laughs> I'm very loud. Um, now listen, let's let's just take a little, little detour here for just regular old folks. You recently had some serious health problems and you had, of all things, brain Ooh. surgery, right? And in the recovery, you had this terrifying moment where something went wrong and you thought you were dying. As someone yeah. personally who's had many multiple near-death experiences herself, I know there's real clarity in those moments. So what did you discover when you thought you were dying? 
yeah, you know, coming, recovering in the hospital and having this, the surgery that had to go up through my nasal cavity and, and the wounds were there and then having this moment where they burst open and, and it's just like a horror movie scene that the, you know, the whole room just was like ridiculous. And I remember in that moment just being really pissed off. I remember just, I kept saying, damn it, damn it, because I realized, okay, I think I'm leaving now and I'm not ready. And that, that, that sort of clarity of how fragile and fleeting life is. And so you come through that and, and really it just crystallizes why we do the work that we do. And it made me just um, the urgency of the day is, is more uh, clear to me than ever. And I want to use this time to really um, to make the world more compassionate than when I arrived. And I think that's that's what we're here for. No, I feel the same way. I've had multiple times where I thought it was the end for me. And for me, it's always clarified what's important in my life because um, the people I wanted to have around me, the people I wanted to see are, it's a very small group. And it always made me appreciate the people who remembered me while I was there struggling, who had the the courtesy to reach out or send me flowers or, or not feel uncomfortable with how sick I looked. Because people often get very uncomfortable with sickness um, and who were able to see my humanity and not make it about themselves. I always found that quite amazing. And then ultimately what you want to leave when you are gone. And that is a huge moment. And some people never get it until the very end. And I think you and I have been given a gift. For sure. And I can remember, I kept saying, I need to see my kids. I need to see my kids. And I kept saying, please get my wife, please get my wife. And I, I thought about my, my mom and I thought about my, my friends and you're right. Life shrinks down into those elemental things. But then on the other hand, then we go back to our work and we say, yes. And because family and because those, those relationships and that small life is so precious, then we want that for other people. I want immigrants to experience the fullness of life. I want LGBTQ teenagers to have all the freedoms and joys that I have. I want everyone to experience that. And so it makes life smaller and it really connects us in the work that we do to other people. Because even if we don't believe in the same God, we are blessed to be here. Yeah. there. I mean, this is, this is fragile and fleeting and, uh, it's just we have to do everything to to protect and care and and make this journey easier for people. I mean, that's what we've been talking about. It's like life is difficult on its best days. So why do we want to make it more difficult? And that's what you see in religious people and a political party that I can't comprehend why you would go out of your way to give people adversity. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for joining me today, John. I'm so deeply inspired by you and your way of looking at the world. And your writing is like a salve on my sad little soul. So now I hope other people have heard you and they will want that same relief. So if they were going to go out in the world and find you, what's the best place to look for your things? Well, if you can spell John Pavlovitz, uh, which is P-A-V-L-O-V-I-T-Z, there's not a lot of us out there. So you'll find me on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and all that stuff. But uh, Lee, I mean, it's just a joy to be with you and uh, hope we get to meet uh, face to face one of these days. So do I. So do I. But until then, we'll both go out there and be positive warriors for humanity. Yes, we are. We are family doing this work. So thank you so much. So that was John Pavlovitz, a modern day philosopher sage, based in the Christian faith, but working with passion to embrace everyone far beyond it. John reminds us that we owe people authenticity and decency, but not permanence. That we have to put our goodness and hope in the world, but sometimes that means loving people at a safe distance to stay out of harm's way. We need to put our energy to those who can be reached, and we have to do the work to reach them. Life is difficult enough, And John questions why anyone would want to make it harder for people. Diversity is better. Kindness is better. It doesn't have to be a war of you against the other, despite what your preachers and politicians might say. We should be collaborating, not competing. Everyone wants a better world. Let's find community in that. As John reminds us, even Jesus wasn't likable all the time. When he was out there fighting for good, he wasn't afraid to speak up. And whether you believe in Jesus or not, I can get down with that idea. Loud and loving, people. Loud and loving. Now go out and make the world a better place. 
Thank you to John Pavlovitz for joining us and to you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.